my name is Adam Tooze. I'm uh, the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History and Director of the European Institute at Columbia University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this book launch for Soft Power Internationalism, Competing for Cultural Influence in the 21st Century Global Order, edited by my friend and colleague Victoria de Grazia and Bertrand Baker-Bakert, and published by Columbia University Press. Uh, the book tells the global history of soft power from the emergence of the US-led liberal order in the 1990s to the resurgence of nationalism and authoritarianism that we're witnessing today, a, a pioneering work of, of contemporary global history. Through a series of case studies of the European Union, China, Brazil, and Turkey, the authors explore how the concept of soft power, initially meant as a tool of US foreign policy, took a life of its own in the hands of other states seeking to counter American hegemony. I'm really delighted to be hosting the two editors of the book, uh, Victoria de Grazia, the more collegiate professor of history at Columbia, and my predecessor as the head of the European Institute, and Boju Bekut, who is assistant professor of urban futures and communication at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and our three panelists who I'm particularly Pleased to welcome and grateful for your attendance, Pierre Vimont, the senior fellow at Carnegie Europe and visiting professor at Columbia, Oliver Stunkel, associate professor of international relations at Getulia Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo, and a co author of Soft Power International. And he contributed a chapter on Brazil's soft power before Bolsonaro. And Stephen Vertheim, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment, who previously was a visiting assistant professor of history at Columbia. We're also fortunate to have with us two co-authors, our book, contributing authors to the book, Anastas Vangeli, assistant professor at the University of Ljubljana and author of the chapter on China's Belt and Road Initiative, and Jack Snyder, who is the Robert and René Belfer Professor of International Relations at Columbia, and who contributed a chapter on illiberal modernity and soft power. So we have a really high powered group with us today. We're going to be able to hear many different perspectives about soft power and the global history of the concept since the 1990s. Uh, the way we're going to run things is that I'll first ask Victoria de Grazia and Butchu Baker to tell us about the concept and the history of soft power and how they came to see the period from 1990 to 2015 as defined by what they call the soft power internationalism of the era. We'll then hear the comments of our three discussants, Pierre, Oliver and Stephen, and I'll be grateful to our, our panelists if they uh, will limit themselves to five minutes so that we can have a conversation after the initial presentations. And we'll then open up to a general discussion with the audience. Um, please uh, use the chat box to ask questions and that will allow us to ping questions to the panelists and uh, get answers for you. And at that point, we'll be joined by Anastas Vangeli and Jack Snyder. I'll ask Victoria de Grazia to help me moderate the general discussion in the latter portion of today's session. Before we start, I would like to say that this book is the result of a multi-year research project conducted by Victoria de Grazia with the support of the Columbia President's Global Innovation Fund and of the European Institute's Initiative on Cultural Power. I would like to thank our co-sponsors of this event, the Department of History, Columbia Global Centers, and the Communications PhD Colloquium. I, I would also like to thank Columbia University Press, which offers a 30% discount for the purchase of Soft Power International, for which you need to use the promo code CUP30 when ordering the book online to claim that discount. Also, please note that this event is being recorded. The event video will be posted on the YouTube channel of the European Institute and on the channels of other sponsors of this book launch. I'll give the floor now to Victoria de Grazia and Bourdieu Bekut. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Adam, for sharing for uh, the, uh, the European Institute for having organized this and all of our sponsors. It's a moment to celebrate um, our co-authors who, who are spread throughout the world. Uh, the Zoom that thus acquires a function that otherwise um, we would not want it to have, and is to bring such a far-flung group, group together. Um, to put it briefly, I conceived this project uh, first of a frustration 
at a simple, maybe simple-minded term, I simply couldn't grasp. And that was the term soft power. Around 2005, I just finished years of work on a book on what I called American market empire, using a Gramscian notion of hegemony, force, and persuasion, and how they interacted in a whole set of social inventions. So I was taken aback when people said, oh, is your book about soft power, as if it were about soft soap, or in any case, it seemed really to be stealing my thunder. So I checked about the origins and the evolution of this term, and I saw that it was associated with and been invented by uh, a distinguished Harvard political scientist, Joseph S. Nye Jr. And he coined that term soft power in response uh, to the emerging new world coming out of the collapse of the Soviet bloc, out of the end of the Cold War, which the Soviets seemed to have lost, but the United States did not seem to have won. The problem for the United States uh, would be to rise to the challenge of another power not existing uh, to uh, act in uh, an alternative to. And this would result, he uh, opined, in a general diffusion of power. So uh, he began, embarked on finding a definition to embrace the, the problems that this generated. And he focused first on getting the one, getting others to want what you want. And this was the beginning of a blueprint for reconsolidating the United States-led international systems without a major enemy in sight. Rather than military might or economic sanctions, and I suggested cultural attraction, norms and values, negotiations over the agenda of global issues such as nuclear disarmament, in which he was an expert, world health, migration, climate change, uh, all of this in the halls of international institutions, which would align a multi multipolar, multi-civilization world with American imperium. Now, for me, this had uh, the hallmarks, this term, of many earlier American social inventions. Here was a brilliant cultural impresario working out of the academic military government uh, 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 complex, appealing to utility, uh, offering something that could work through markets and civil societies by attraction. It was a win-win solution, uh, uh, reducing the price of uh, costly wars and promising amazingly rapid diffusion. And there was a terrible flim flat in 2001, 11 to respond to critics who revealed that Nye had twice met with uh, Muammar al-Qaddafi in Libya between 2006 and 2008 on the payroll of uh, Monitor Co Consulting Group of Boston and been paid $250,000 to do this. He himself wrote in the New Republic that at the time the autocrat seems to have become interested in soft power, the art of projecting influence or attraction rather than erosion in effect uh, Nye had been in, in Gaddafi's tent at Tripoli in order to explain to him how to do it, what was the proper road to success uh, in uh, a multipolar world. The problem to me was why the term caught on. In other words, was this another example of America's global hegemony being uh, restored? And you can get some sense of uh, what I was thinking about by, from this Google uh, engram view. Let's see if I can get the uh, here, excuse me, this quickly. Um, oh dear. Um, which which um, uh, show the enormous upsurge of, 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 and the diffusion of these terms. So the problem I had was how to get outside of the American empire, how to get outside as well Europe too, which was using a comparable term somewhat in, in competition with the United States, which was normative power. And for that purpose, I began, we began to use Columbia's global centers, which were the recently established instrument of Columbia's step into academic globalization. And we were going to use this as a kind of jumping off point to, to, to begin to develop a kind of world to depovincialize this term. And so we worked, okay, gathering people in, uh, okay, 
first, first of all, uh, Burju Baycourt, who began to work with me from the School of Journalism at Columbia, an expert in media. And she brought to me the first insights that I had about the myth about the development of global internet that would make it pr promote horizontal, pluralistic and democratic networks dominated by civilian power with the US so grabbing the lead here uh, as the leading power in the 1990s as an engine of how actions on the part of the government and US global companies could capitalize on these resources. Uh, but she also highlighted how all of this could boomerang by mobilizing regional hegemons to promote national counterforces to it, a point that she'll begin to address uh, in her own presentation. And then we gathered in historians, Dilek Barlas and and Lerna Yannick, a geopolitical scientist from Turkey, their work highlighted that behind Erdogan's, uh, President Erdogan's efforts, Minister the President Erdogan's efforts, uh, there, there was an effort to promote a more autonomous role, opening up the, the spaces that were being left by the United States in the Eastern Mediterranean and by the Soviets um, in the Turkic areas of the post uh, uh, Soviet uh, area. They saw as it, uh, that, that Erdogan was using it as an engine to grow his regional autonomy. Uh, at the same time, Mustafa um, Kutley came in, political scientist, he recalled the influence that trading powers exercised um, for, uh, Germany and Japan through their global trade networks, in the, especially notably in the 1980s, which seemed to undercut American power and how Turkey in fact was engaged in this way, um, challenging um, uh, the, the, the United States and post-Soviet uh, powers um, with the same kind of growth and growing trade. Brazil here was a real eye-opener. Oliver Stuckel saw Brazil priding itself as a republic of diplomats as it moved from dictatorship uh, to liberal government, presenting itself as a natural leader uh, of the global south, but also as a, a, a kind of transatlantic connection uh, with, with, with Africa making winning bids to host World Cup and Olympics, challenging the United States on the Iran sanctions, and generally growing, wanting to grow an autonomous power uh, uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in the international arena. And jean Thib and Fernando Santo Mauro, they would never use the term South Power. They refused. They saw it in the whole question in another way uh, that um, Brazil was still subordinate in, to a liberal clouds uh, that shrouded the operations of global cap capitalism. And so even though in this particular conjuncture, it was able to move out, um, especially in its uh, aid uh, toward, uh, toward, toward, toward Africa, um, it was unable to uh, endure the collapse of the commodity boom, the corruption scandals that enveloped uh, Lula's government, and the eventual defeat of this assertive diplomacy. It would have been possible for us to probe China. Uh, we had uh, with, without uh, Martina Bassan, who is Italian, trained in France, a uh, longtime Sinologist and Africanist, because she showed how, how as a story in a historical way, how uh, interestingly uh, China in the present period and in the period of our, that we were studying, how much it was building on the Maoist tradition of development in Africa. Uh, 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 Yangling Peng did a wonderful job uh, having been one of the first to comment on Chinese soft power, on so called Chinese soft power, power, soft power with Chinese characteristics, and showing the unfolding of the concept uh, in, 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 in China uh, as early as 1905. Um, and finally, with respect to chi China, we had a real breakthrough with. Uh, Anastas Vangeli came on because he working in the Balkans, working in East Central Europe, was able to see how much the Chinese were working there, developing relations that in some ways reproduce the kinds of relations that ex had existed in different ways during the, uh, the period of the socialist blocs. Uh, that is, that there was a kind of foreshadowing. Uh, finally, uh, we have my dear colleague, Thomas Diaz, long time 
if you want, interlocutor about Europe, uh, who more and more had a pessimistic view of Europe's exercise of persuasive power. And then Jack Snyder, who will speak for himself, but who was posing constantly the pressing question whether you could have soft power internationalism uh, if it involved illiberal powers. Okay. So building on their it wasn't input, it was a redefinition of the term. It was, it was, it was a, in an effort to block using the term, which was always redolent of American power, American um, military and diplomatic power. We explored the plurality of soft powers um, emerging in different, very different political contexts uh, and uh, uh, political and cultural contexts around the globe. Low. So the result that we have here is a comparative study, uh, which also tries to develop this notion of a soft power internationalism, that is as a, a, a particular way during an interregnum between the fall of the Soviet Union, 1990, and 2015, where we see uh, that the, the, the end of this effort to create a growing difficulty, so perhaps the possibility of, present, of, of seeing a new global international order, liberal based on the soft power internationalism, which Nye had in a sense hypothesized with his, and hoped for with his use of the term, even if he never expected that it would be picked up with such efficacy and alacrity uh, to promote these new regional uh, hegemons, some of which, mainly the Soviet the Union, I mean, Russia, excuse me, and China have been particularly you know, pressing in terms of proposing themselves as counter hegemons. So this then is the very broad scope of the work and you know, gradually we'll be able to unpack um, more effectively, I hope, uh, with, to our speakers and in the discussion exactly the kinds of sensibility that we brought to defining the term and whether it's useful for trying to understand this intermediate period uh, before, if you want, 2015, the sense that uh, the world that we knew has gotten quite out of control. Okay, Adam, thank you. You, Bojo, do you want to? Um... Yeah, thank you, Adam. Um, first, um, I, I'm very aware of the five minute limit, but I want to shout out to some of our authors who are in the audience. I see Tomas and Fernando. I also see some folks from the global centers or people who have been with us when we were traveling to do this project. So I'm not going to name everyone, but I hope that when we move on to the Q&A that we get to hear from you because, you know, we would love to celebrate this book with you all. Um, so I'm just going to talk very quickly about the communicative aspect, because from the very beginning, it was clear to Victoria and I that the Internet or digital technologies were playing a very crucial role in this narrative that we were building. Historically speaking, soft power and the global Internet share deep affinities, both being born in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War, attempting to envision a US-led, but also you know, more multilateral, civilian, cooperative interdependency. So we wanted to understand what was specific about this mode of communication within the history and the conception of soft power and soft power internationalism. But I wanna highlight that in the book, we're not only focusing on the internet's capacity as a broadcast medium, we also recognize the global internet as a critical infrastructure, as well as a transnational market. And that helps us see that first, the governance of the space is itself a part of the soft and hard power history, uh, whose values or norms will dominate the way that the internet will be regulated or how will apps or platforms or content will circulate across borders. Nation states try to project their values onto internet governance, um, and they use internet to challenge each other's norms and practices. Mm -hmm. Second, we recognize that the internet itself as a material infrastructure of broadband networks and data infrastructures have long been used to build alliances as well as controlling each other. So we found a clear trajectory from the US investment in connectivity infrastructures in the mid to late 1990s to the dominance of Silicon Valley based but cosmopolitan looking US tech companies in the 2000s 
Obama administration's investment in the internet freedom agenda, and most recently China's Belt and Road Initiative that I'm looking forward to discussing more with Anastas, which is a much more sophisticated, large scale and connected vision of building um, digital infrastructures. Uh, while kind of documenting this history, this aligned history between the global internet and soft power internationalism, we suggest, we, we had two goals or we suggest two arguments. One is, uh, to challenge the idea that there was a time when the global internet was truly cosmopolitan and post-national. Um, instead, we suggest it has always been geopolitical. And second, um, looking at the global internet and soft power together challenges that binary between soft and hard power that I hope we discuss in the Q&A. Uh, many of the tools that we consider to be the soft products of Silicon Valley, for example, depended on ongoing military funding, which ramped up, not surprisingly, post 9-11. Um, especially during the Obama administration, we saw this blending of soft and hard power agenda when the State Department actively kind of pushed internet freedom and involved tech executives in rebuilding Afghanistan or Iraq, while also running a massive surveillance intelligence infrastructure across the world as exposed by the WikiLeaks and um, Snowden revelation. So just to give you an example to illustrate that sort of blurring between those boundaries, around that time in 2013, Google's former CEO, Eric Schmidt, wrote a book with a former advisor to Secretary Clinton, Jared Cohen, about the importance of not letting China take over the global internet and ask US policymakers to be more vigilant in protecting US leadership in internet governance. So the so-called tech cold war uh, did not sort of emerge like a few years ago. It, it had a longer sort of trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, but marking the internet as a space that can only be governed by liberal countries is a very familiar narrative to Nye's own claim mm -hmm. that only liberal democratic countries could wield soft power. Again, putting these two histories together revealed to us a new binary, this time between authoritarian and democratic qualities underlying soft power and the global internet, thereby allowing us to further challenge the self-interested decisions packed in these political agendas and globally circulating concepts. I'm kind of giving these examples and um, these empirical bits to uh, kind of leave breadcrumbs for us to further discuss in the Q&A and really uh, demonstrate how the book really attempted to show the historical and political baggage these concepts brought in as different countries were grappling with these uh, practices and uh, concepts of soft power and the global internet. So I'll leave it here and turn it over to Adam. Thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, tantalizing, I love the phrase breadcrumbs, uh, that's one to, one to borrow. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask our three commentators now to, to pick up some of those hints. Um, uh, Pierre, would you like to would you like to um, be our first intervener? With pleasure, uh, Adam, and um, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, discussion on what I thought was a very uh, interesting and thoughtful uh, um, a book, um, and I. I I enjoyed it tremendously, even if at the end of the day, I'm somewhat bemused by the concept of soft power uh, uh, today. As, uh, as Victoria was, was rightly saying, um, the ambiguity of, uh, of the concept itself um, creates this sort of uh, 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 blurring concept that can be very useful to everyone and that can be used by all in order to um, promote what what is after all their own foreign policy uh, and even to some extent i was wondering uh, remembering my my old memories of uh, of the Quai the french foreign uh, ministry foreign affairs ministry that at the time when i came into the um, the Quai my elders my bosses used to tell me that the best example of soft power dated back around 
the 1947-48. It was not the Marshall Plan in their opinion. It was the way the uh, American administration at that time managed to get the um, free flow of US motion pictures into Europe uh, with no duties at all. And that was the real first um, stroke of genius um, uh, from the US administration to promote soft, uh, soft power. Um, but I understand very well what you're trying to do in, in pinpointing this very period of the 1990s up to 2015 or something like that, this small window of opportunity where the liberal uh, international order seemed to be um, moving ahead and triumphing uh, over uh, all other values and, and principles. But I have... Two questions I would I would raise, I think, or two comments to make. Um, one is about the way on one side uh, the uh, United States moved ahead with its um, uh, with its soft power concept, and how the European Union on its side trying to promote its own its own normative power (NPE) as you as you call it in in, in your book. And I wonder to some extent whether there has ever been a real genuine normative power uh, from the EU. Um, in other words, has it ever flied uh, at, at any point? Uh, because if, if you look at, at the same historical period, um, Europe was uh, brought into the whole West Balkan conflict during 10 years and been, we didn't see much of any kind of European power. But then came out of it with a great ambition. Javier Solana uh, released the EU a new strategy uh, where they talked uh, precisely about Europe being a transformative power that is going to push new principle, new values for a new international order. But as quite often with Europe, as soon as they came out with this great statement, they faced their own inward uh, internal problems. Um, the um, difficulty of France and Netherlands, and in fact, the, um, the um, uh, refusal by France and Netherlands to go ahead with the constitutional treaty, um, the uh, uh, breakdown of the um, uh, financial markets in 2008, uh, Vladimir Putin coming up with his new idea of what should be a European security order, the invasion of Georgia, uh, so on and so forth. And therefore, what was a potential um, soft power or normative power from the European Union, in fact, never materialized in, in, in any way. And in my opinion, this has nothing to do with the fact that um, the uh, normative power of the European Union um, was still uh, still born uh, a power from the beginning. It has to do with the um, the making of the European foreign policy, and it's um, and it's the whole concept of what European Union is all about. European Union can be a normative power when this normative power is mostly connected to the single market. Um, it plays a normative power with its norms, its industrial norms. It plays um, maybe a normative power with its um, new rules about data protection um, or competition and the competition decision it takes. But out of this, when it goes to a more uh, overwhelming concept of um, dealing with the transformation of the international order, I think it stops very short of what it wants to do because it hasn't either the, the will, the assets or the tools to do that at the moment. And I think we always come back to that. So my question is, has there ever been a, a truly genuine normative power Europe um, up, up, up to now? And the second comment I would like to make, which is also maybe a question, is that um, has really soft power, taking in the uh, large concept that the whole book uh, puts forward time and again, has this come at a moment when, in fact, all the uh, um, uh, lines, division lines between war and peace, 
um, between liberal democracy and a liberal democracy, so on and so forth, I could go on and on. Uh, all these division lines have been more and more blurred and somewhat disappeared in the international order we're facing today. Yeah? Um, what is the name of the type of confrontation or competition that we're facing between China and US? Uh, between Russia and the rest of the European continent. Um, what are really the values of uh, the democratic values that the uh, promoters of soft power are trying to push forward at the moment? Where are they exactly? Haven't they been also somewhat blurred by what we have witnessed in the United States under Trump, in Hungary or Poland at the moment in, in Europe? And is all this and this kind of uh, context we're facing today totally changing um, the way foreign policy is, um, is uh, defined and the way the international order is being morphing into something rather new that we don't know exactly what this is all about. And at the end of the day, this small window of opportunity that was put for the soft power being the sort of 15 or 20 years that you are talking about in your uh, a very good um, uh, uh, book. Is this not a moment when the soft power already was under great pressure and having great difficulty to find its way in this blurred division lines um, that I'm talking about? I'll stop there. I've been quite too long, Adam, but um, this was a few ideas I wanted to put forward. Yeah, absolutely invaluable to have your, your perspective from the side of European diplomacy. Um, uh, Oliver, Oliver Stunkel, I, 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 I was hoping that you would be able to um, give us a few remarks. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'd like to um, make a few comments sort of on, from this perspective on uh, Brazil, uh, which I think... Um, is really torn about uh, the soft power con uh, concept on the one hand, uh, sensing so the irresistible power of the narrative, but at the same time being profoundly uh, wary and concerned about uh, the impact of the end of the Cold War and uh, sort of understanding that soft, po the soft power narrative would make US power look more, less blatant, more benign, mm -hmm. But in the end, uh, it wasn't enough to ease the concern that has really shaped uh, Brazil's understanding of the post-Cold War world over the past uh, 30 years, in part because bipolarity, of course, produced significant benefits uh, uh, for some countries, but also because unipolarity was just seen as a tremendous threat to uh, Brazil's sovereignty, to the sovereignty of, of several other uh, developing countries and the the concern, despite the soft power narrative of, you know, what was what's the the multipolar order really worth if the largest power uh, claims to uh, see further than the rest and uh, uh, si uh, signals that perhaps not all the rules apply uh, to the hegemon. And I remember um, a while back, the Economist created this uh, this contrast and said, you know, the United States has soft power and China has sharp power. And it was really quite interesting how uh, in the developing world, everybody sort of said, well, that's a bit, you know, rich, uh, considering of, you know, the, the history of US foreign policy uh, in the global south. And it was really quite interesting how, uh, how that seemed to, you know, uh, to have a lot of uptake in the global north, but wasn't really seen as, as so meaningful in the global south. But what soft power did do, and that's my second point, uh, irrespective of regime type, irrespective of where you're sitting in the world, there was a clear understanding that this was, uh, this signified a broadening consensus that economic and military uh, uh, strength were not the only types of power that matter, and that there was a need to articulate some kind of moralism. And even in China, Yan Xiaotong wrote about moral realism, uh, about higher quality, higher quality moral leadership. Uh, and in Brazil, this really felt like a glove over, over what Brazil sought to project and embraced soft power uh, in a tremendous way that suddenly everything Brazil did was really about soft power. It was a country that sought a seat at the table of the powerful without nuclear weapons. It was the only BRICS country without 
a significant military means. It was a defender of multilateralism, of, ben of so-called benign multipolarity. And uh, it sought to project itself as a unique country with a unique perspective, both Western and non-Western, both BRICS and OECD, G77, developing country, democracy, racial democracy, quote unquote, sort of projecting that image, which is of course, it, it, it is not. Uh, but also sort of using that in order to claim a greater legitimacy and agonizing quite a lot when Brazil uh, violated these very principles, such as when it did not uh, condemn Russia for its invasion of Crimea in order to preserve uh, the, the BRICS partnership. And just to finish, uh, one of the, let's say, an example of the outgrowth of Brazil's attempt to project itself as a soft power nation was the fact that despite recently having overcome very tangible developing country problems like extreme poverty and hunger, Brazil transformed itself into humanitarian donor, both in Latin America and in Africa, su suggesting that it sort of uh, was a different actor than Western countries because it did have a special understanding of what it means to have been a recipient country so recently. Um, so in a sense, I think um, it's quite interesting that even though the soft power concept was coined in the United States and adapted to a US context, it was really readily taking up, taken up also by countries in a completely different geopolitical context uh, like Brazil. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, thank you so much Oliver. Um, that's a really fascinating set of contrasts that are, we're building up here. Um, can I ask uh, Stephen Bertheim to uh, unmute and um, give us your perspective from, from Washington, I think. Where are you, Stephen? I am uh, regrettably in Washington, thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I think the editors and contributors are to be congratulated for accomplishing something quite difficult, which is assembling a global history of a, of a concept and a recent concept at that. Uh, the book shows compellingly to my mind that soft power was something new and distinctive, a specific and explicit frame for a set of international practices. Now foreign ministries have soft power programs and organizations have devised things like the Global Soft Power Index. Soft power then operates on the level of international society as an arena of contestation with participation by a range of different actors. And in that respect, soft power uh, is reminiscent to me of the concept of public opinion in the interwar period. Public opinion coming out of World War I was enthroned as the central uh, ideology of liberal internationalism and the League of Nations invoked by new international bureaucrats in Geneva, uh, new technocrats who boosted information technologies and powers great and small. Uh, and uh, through the interwar period, public opinion as a concept underwent a somewhat similar trajectory to what looks like the fate of soft power from the 1990s to the present. Initially meant to establish mutual understanding and replace the resort to armed force, public opinion turned out to be susceptible to manipulation. It was subsumed by totalitarian regimes. It became an arena for a propaganda war uh, in World War II and then the Cold War. I think that comparison also brings into relief, however, that soft power was never nearly as emancipatory in its appeal as public opinion was. Proponents of public opinion held out the promise of making war a thing of the past and organizing the world in a fundamentally new way. Soft power was, from its first articulation, an instrument of power projection, which brings me to Joe Nye's original work in 1990, which is archly analyzed by, by Victoria de Grazia in her chapter, I just want to, to add that the concept was uh, oddly empty of strategic content. Nye coined soft power in Foreign Policy magazine at the same time that uh, Reagan's UN ambassador, Jean Kirkpatrick, wondered why the United States needed to project power widely at all, calling for America to become now a normal country in a normal time. Nye, in his essay, mounts not so much a counter argument as a deflection. He asserts that those who seek retrenchment are wrong, but instead of offering reasons, he switches the conversation. He writes that the real issue is not whether American power is or should rise or fall, but rather that the nature of power is changing. Soft power is becoming more 
important and the United States, good news, is well positioned to wield it. And so what's missing from this analysis is why uh, the United States should, what, well, what the United States should want to make other countries do, to what end? That is, there's no real analysis of interests and objectives, just an assumption that one should want to have as much power as possible. Uh, so in an, in an American context, then Nye's concept of soft power uh, might matter, not just for the terrain it, it then opened up, but also for closing down uh, what might have been a debate about hard power. Uh, and if so, it, it, it functions perhaps in a somewhat similar way as the concept of multilateralism, uh, which seems to promise a taming of hard power hegemony of coercion in the world, but in fact establishes such a low bar and is so indeterminate as to uh, potentially impose little constraint. Um, and that's another concept that uh, smaller powers find useful to wield as well. So in that sense, soft power may be part of the story of how the United States uh, misses a chance in the 1990s uh, to recast its foreign policy and instead pursues a global political military primacy uh, as a project that really uh, has no definition of how it might end. So uh, I just want to pose one question uh, looking toward the future, which is, does soft power generate any new effects now that it has passed its prime, and then some, uh, for several years now? And I wonder if a rather perverse answer suggests itself in China's wolf warrior diplomacy, or indeed in Donald Trump's punitive stance toward American allies and foes alike. Are we seeing the use of soft power not to attract or persuade others, but to offend and repel them, perhaps for the purpose of creating division, of creating an in-group and an out-group, no longer a universal order? Um, you know, it's perhaps precisely the decades of uh, soft power enthusiasm that has turned the rhetorical domain into such an intense arena, even when um, the United States and China have not so far taken correspondingly grave hard power actions, whether economically or even militarily. So a performative Cold War might be what you get by investing so much importance in the domain of soft power, uh, but by losing faith in the ability or desirability of attraction, uh, at least on a universal basis. So just a thought, uh, I'll leave it there and look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Stephen. That, those were very interesting. Uh thoughts really on, on what this might have meant for the American side and the door that it might have opened. Um, we have two contributors to the volume, not formally on the panel, but here on the call. The lines are obviously a little blurry in the world of Zoom. Um, perhaps, Anastas, would you like to come in and give us, give us your take? Um, one of the contributors, I understand, on the One Belt, One Road side. Uh, it, it would be great to get your great your take, uh, perhaps, of some of the dynamics with regard to China. And then I'll hand off to Victoria uh, for chairing the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thanks to uh, Victoria and Burju for the great editing work and, and pushing this through even as the pandemic was starting. And seeing, of course, the, the final product makes me uh, very happy. Uh, I contributed indeed a chapter on the uh, Belt and Road. Uh, I focused especially on the case of the uh, countries of Central East, Southeast Europe. Uh, and in particular, uh, I, I contributed more my, uh, well, my empirical uh, insights uh, in how these uh, China-led forums for interactions between uh, Chinese and non-Chinese, in this case, Central East, Southeast European actors, uh, work and for, for those that are not familiar that much with, with China and the Belt and Road. Uh, uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, basically China established uh, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, international institutions, uh, which uh, at some point gained a common denominator and a common identity with the Belt and Road Initiative. And I have to say, uh, theoretically, I sort of uh, departed from the soft power framework uh, since I was looking uh, more through my you know, sociological perspective, uh, I um, employed the theory of uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, symbolic power, basically power that reshapes thinking and practice that doesn't ne necessarily stem from uh, attraction or from this you know, idea of soft power being similar to public opinion, 
but rather distance from the act of speaking uh, from a particular uh, position and with a particular uh, vision for the world. So I was basically looking at how in these forums for interaction established by Chinese actors, they use the position to set up the rules and, and, and uh, set up a particular uh, vision and a narrative under which they come together with the non-Chinese participants. Uh, so basically, uh, that was one of the dynamics uh, I, I was uh, I was looking at this kind of uh, asymmetrical uh, role. Basically, you have uh, a very kind of exceptional situation. This is, of course, not just in the case of Central and Southeast Europe, but in many regions in the world where you had uh, the Chinese actors being the ones convening a bunch of different countries, uh, 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 representatives not just from policy, but also from, from business, from uh, civil society from the media and so on. Uh, and then I was looking also at the dynamics uh, through which, you know, the role of these non-Chinese uh, participants uh, in their own context is being uh, affected. They, they become more important in their domestic societies, uh, just as China gains uh, importance, uh, so becomes more popular. So these people uh, have more role, more say in their own domestic society. So basically what is being uh, uh, said and discussed in those forums now also has a, a, a channel to be transmitted to the um, domestic societies. And then, uh, of course, I was looking at the, the whole uh, impact of the geoeconomic uh, uh, imaginary of the New Silk Roads, basically this whole vision of, of railroads, container ports, um, uh, we mentioned digital infrastructure, uh, and so on. Uh, of course, I, I Took 20, uh, I found uh, 2015 being a very nice uh, kind of uh, a border, uh, like boundary between what uh, China could achieve by then and uh, the challenges it faced afterwards in projecting its vision in Central and Southeast Europe, but I guess that could be general, uh, generalized to the whole Belt and Road. Uh, so basically in the period 2011 to 2015, they really managed to, to capitalize on the sentiment immediately after the global financial crisis. Uh, so basically uh, reframing uh, the, the whole relationship uh, with the region. Uh, China and the Central and Southeast European countries, they had somewhat of a uh, intricate relationship uh, in the Cold War, but then in the post-Cold War era, China was framed through very much uh, this ideological lens through the, uh, as these countries were democratizing. So they, they, they in the, uh, the, the 90s, early 2000s, they saw China as a, uh, you know, this uh, communist dictatorship, this uh, remnant, this uh, reminiscent of what they had before. Uh, uh, and it's, it's very interesting how in those initial years after the global financial crisis uh, and with the launch of the Belt and Road, China managed to, to basically even uh, uh, taking into account this uh, negative reputation it had in the region, it managed to sort of reframe the whole relationship through the prism of economic opportunity uh, however, after 2015, uh, you know, 2015 in the context of China and let's say uh, uh, the periphery marks a year when, you know, before that this relationship was more or less desecuritized. So um, people, uh, let's say uh, in DC, in, in, in uh, Western European capitals, they voiced their dissatisfaction, but until 2015, this was more of a, you know, not as prominent. However, after 2015, especially you know, with Donald Trump and, and the changes that happened, uh, we saw a trend of securitization of, of uh, the, the, the topic of China, which then conversely had an effect on uh, uh, the projection of its power in, in the recipient uh, regions and countries. Uh, and uh, I, I end with, with that point in my chapter, basically uh, that was written uh, two years ago in those two years since, uh, we've seen quite some friction in, in, with some of the Central and Southeast uh, European countries. Uh, Lithuania most notably has uh, uh, announced abandoning uh, the China-led formats for interaction. On the other hand, we have the COVID-19 pandemic, which, you know, if one takes, uh, uh, if one uh, can take uh, the, the global financial crisis as the first instance where, you know, it creates some opening for China, I guess the, the, the post-COVID era could echo some of that, especially you know, countries that will be more affected economically. Uh, but anyway, we, we, we leave that for the uh, uh, discussion session later. Thank you very much. 
I'm not, not mistaken, I'm now in charge. Is that right? Um, uh, Jack Snyder was, is, is going to speak to address some of the questions that I, uh, including the one that he constantly uh, uh, brought up about how the relationship between an illiberal soft power uh, and uh, the liberal uh, international order. Jack? Yeah, thanks, Vicki. Um, I want to reminisce about uh, the glorious early days of the project where we explained to each other what our goal was. And uh, often we use the, the phrase uh, decentering soft power. Uh, the idea that it was unfair that only the United States of America got to have soft power to enhance its hegemony. And why couldn't uh, middle powers, especially the rising middle powers, also have strategies of promoting themselves through soft power? And so that's uh, why our chapter structure looks the way it does in the book. And uh, so I just wanted to ask uh, the question of, well, what did we learn about the success of uh, these rising middle powers in um, trying out soft power strategies? Uh, how did that work out for them? And reflecting back on this history, uh, I would propose that the prestige of uh, all of our powers that we studied was at its height uh, in the decade between 2000 and 2010, when these countries were, for the most part, um, projecting an image of participation and support in the liberal international order. Uh, basking in the, the liberal uh, mainstream idea of soft power and succeeding. Uh, and that uh, each of these countries uh, soft power efforts after about 2010 uh, seriously flopped uh, when it was most distinctively pushing uh, a, a national program that was um, involving frictions with uh, the liberal mainstream idea of what should constitute soft power. Uh, so uh, Turkey, um, its prestige was riding high in that first decade after the IMF came in and helped it uh, reorganize its finances. Uh, Turkey uh, had uh, in those years great successes in exporting to Europe um, and uh, great successes in uh, reforming its institutions in candidacy uh, for membership in uh, the EU. Uh, but uh, when that ran out of gas uh, and uh, the idea of neo-Ottomanism -Ottoman, took the place of uh, good citizen of Europe. Uh, the Ottomanism was a flop. Uh, you know, the countries that had actually been historically part of the Ottoman Empire uh, showed no interest in the Turkish neo-Ottoman uh, project. Um, it's certainly true that Turkey, you know, ramped up economic relations with the Gulf, but it's not clear that the soft power of neo-Ottomanism was necessary uh, for that. Um, things that had uh, a prominent neo-Ottoman label attached to them, uh, like the Ottoman barracks uh, replacing uh, Gezi Park uh, led to a huge anti-Erdogan protest and uh, was a, a step in the decline of Erdogan's prestige, which is you know now at a low, uh, having ruined uh, the economy. Uh, so 
uh, Brazil also uh, was at its peak in those early years when all the BRICs, including Brazil, were growing at 6% uh, a year. And Brazil at that point was promoting the idea of uh, Brazil as a mediator for Middle East uh, political squabbles something that was very benign and increased uh, Brazil's prestige, I guess, except for the fact that nobody really was very interested in Brazil's mediation. Uh, when Brazil's economy collapsed, uh, then Brazil was no longer in the soft power game. Um, China uh, was at its height of prestige and uh, was ranked among one of the most popular countries in the world, uh, not quite at Germany's level, but up there in the period of uh, so-called peaceful rise under Hu Jintao, where China was undertaking like slow, very modest reforms, uh, having just joined the WTO, uh, but uh, in the last decade after China uh, has abandoned the reform path and gone the wolf warrior path, uh, even things that it does that may actually be constructive like BRI uh, have uh, been criticized as being uh, just a, a debt for equity trap, uh, which for the most part isn't even true, but uh, so China has uh, you know, really gone out of its way to destroy any soft power that it had. And it's done so by uh, asserting its um, cultural and national distinctiveness uh, and by turning its back on the idea of peaceful rise and cooperating with international economic liberal norms. Um, the one, the, the one regional power that actually uh, seems to have had some success with its uh, soft power enterprise is Putin's Russia, which actually has created this uh, contrarian sovereignty hawk, authoritarian, uh, cultural uh, conservatism uh, package of uh, like self-presentation and offered it to the world as a, a project that uh, others should join. Uh, so uh, it's you know clear that uh, you know we see the the rise of the the far right in Europe, uh, which from time to time has had some serious flirtations with Russia and um, you know, the bromance with Trump. And so it seems that the, the, this Putin formula got some traction, but even there, uh, as I wrote in my chapter, uh, I think there's a problem creating soft power among a bunch, uh, among a bunch of uh, far right nationalist social movements and countries because nationalists, generally don't want to cooperate as their top priority. They just want to be themselves and look to their own national interests. Um, a couple of scholars at N NYU, uh, Hadassah Rohn, uh, lead author, did a paper that looked at all of the foreign policy manifestos of the uh, European far-right parties and found that their uh, foreign policies were all over the map. There was the only thing that they agreed on was that immigration was bad. Uh, they didn't even agree that Russia was good. No, no. Uh, in fact, when uh, Salvini, uh, the Italian far right movement guy, tried to cash in on the immigration uh, issue and create a coalition of far-right parties on this in the European Parliament, it was a complete failure because Italy's interest was getting other countries in Europe to 
join in and distribute the burdens of dealing with the migrants from North Africa rather than Italy just being stuck with it. And so his coalition was a flop. Um, so one of the you know, successes, uh, so to speak, of uh, right-wing authoritarian nationalism in Europe has been Poland, but Poland remains one of the most anti-Russian of the states of, of Europe. So my conclusion is that um, the, the decentering of uh, soft power um, worked only when uh, these states were playing ball with the international liberal order, when they went their own way in uh, nationalist directions, uh, it was mostly a flop. Um, but this is also not good news for re recentering soft power. Uh, if soft power is to be measured by, for the US by uh, its creation of the internet and its practically its ownership of many of the key social media platforms, uh, I would I would argue that there's been nothing that's undermined American soft power more than the poisonous discourse uh, on the internet that our internet uh, tech giants have spread worldwide. So um, my take home is like beware of of uh, trying to profit from soft power because I I see. Um, a lot of uh, uh, self-inflicted wounds in this direction. Okay, thanks, Jack. Thank you very much. I think we're gonna have a very interesting exchange between you suggesting that the soft power is a, a, a no-win uh, offer <laughs> we want from the United States and, and the kinds of points that um, Oliver raised about how in effect, there may not necessarily, because of an American objective, and Stephen highlights that one has to be very curious about exactly what kind, what were the objectives in the early 90s, whether it was perhaps a vacuum in foreign policy debate that spurred this word forward. Uh, Oliver is arguing that notwithstanding that this created a, a kind of space for a, a more ethical, a more, uh, a, a more egalitarian, possibly a rebalancing of American immense uh, military power, also its weight in the internet and uh, its uh, weight in the global markets. So we've set up now sets of questions and I'm going to try to recapitulate and hand out I mean, so I, let's start with um, uh, Ambassador Vimon's question, very pointed question, I think, about the European Union and how one would consider it there. The term normative power emerges uh, in a much less propulsive way at the same time as the words term soft power. And it develops, it's counterposed to the notion of soft power with the argument that the European Union is coming out of a sovereignty that was created without war. And therefore its relationship is it's created out of conflicts over norms, out of values. And therefore it's in a particular kind of position uh, with respect to the United States and globally uh, to be a very important foreign policy actor. Let me turn that over to uh, Tomas Diaz, uh, who um, contributed to the volume. I know has thoughts on this. To... Thank, thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Uh, thank, thanks for in, inviting me to this project. Thank you, Bojo, for for doing so. And uh, and I, I just I wanted to make three very quick comments um, in response to uh, Ambassador Vimont's remarks and and, uh, and and some of the the themes that are that we're discussing, and and, and the first one uh, is perhaps to say that I also understood the agenda of decentering soft power 
to to say that there are perhaps alternative concepts out there in the world yeah. that uh, that actually put the soft power into perspective uh, and, and normative power i think is is one of them and i think it's worth saying that this is older than soft power in the sense that it's that its pedigree goes back to the idea uh, of civilian power in the 1970s mm -hmm. uh, and i think it's very interesting to to perhaps look at the, the way that if we if we look at Stephen um, Wertheim's arguments about you know how soft power emerged as a sort of antidote to other conceptions of power that civilian power emerged as an antidote to other conceptions of power namely the idea that uh, that or the demand of the time that the European Union would the European then community would become a normal power and would would uh, would acquire more power of a traditional kind and it was against that uh, that uh, François de Chêne at the time actually developed this idea of civilian power as a kind of counter concept. Uh, and I think that's an important kind of um, uh, uh, insight in the sense that A, there's been something around which was also seen as a sort of uh, a different idea of what power could be in a new world um, from a new type of actor. But it also says something about uh, this concept actually being in a sense in a, in a, in a, in a, in a narrative contest over what um, the European Union's power would actually be. Uh, and as a critique of traditional understandings of power. Uh, and, and this gets me to my, to my second point and that I would say that uh, normative power has always been used in two different ways. It's been used as a description of what the EU is and then sort of as a measure uh, against which then European Union behavior was sort of uh, um, uh, compared. And, and, and then often, of course, then uh, as Ambassador Vimond was saying, the EU failed. Uh, that the EU then, I think he's right in saying that the EU never quite had that normative power. Mm -hmm. But I read Ian Manners' work, who was, was introduced this concept slightly differently, and I read it as taking part in that narrative contest over you know, what European power should be, and therefore rather in the spirit of critique. And I think, I think that you know, changes uh, the concept slightly. And in that sense, of course, the easy way to answer um, Pierre Vimon's question is to say that uh, he's asking the wrong question because from that point of view it is not about you know is the EU or is not but it is about you know are there alternative roles that the EU could take and then the third quick point I want to make so if we do take the answer seriously of course the classic arguments um, uh, of, of where the EU might have had normative power are in relation to uh, climate policy around the Kyoto Protocol are in relation to uh, the promotion of the ICC, are in relation to its model role in various forms of regionalism. Um, uh, and then there is Ian Manner's own example, which I think is a rather cheap one uh, on, on the death penalty. Um, now, I think, you know, I think all of these examples are to say that even though you're not a um, unified foreign policy actor, uh, and of course, uh, Pierre Vimon can tell us uh, long stories about the, the, the fighting and the, and the struggles, huh? even though you're not always a unified foreign policy actor, you could still have uh, normative power in these kind of pockets. But of course, it's also absolutely clear that these pockets of normative power were bound to a sort of this, this, this moment of this liberal moment of a world order. And so there was a sort of, sort of um, a context that allowed this to, to happen. And we also should have, um, we should be clear that these pockets of normative power were not sort of um, without hard power attached to them. Uh, they were going together with the market power that the EU had, and they were going together with, you know, uh, struggles against the United States, say in Africa, you know, trying to sort of push African states to say, sign up to the Rome Statute. And, you know, whereas the US was then threatening to withdraw development. And so there were all these hard power struggles going on at the same time as well. And so I think Birch was point in the beginning that we shouldn't sort of think of normative power and uh, or soft power as being completely opposed to hard power is I think a very important point as well. I just, I just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think you address Oliver's point in some ways follows up uh, on that. I mean, it's more of a query um, when, about the 
space that this moment, I'm not so sure it was the soft power initiative of Nye, but that gave a kind of formalization to this effort, perhaps post humanitarian, the post, post humanitarian movement to, to think about or find space for a more moral normative force um, beyond military power. And so the question is, well, you know, what is driving this? Is it you know, a, a, a crude kind of rebalancing crude? That's not such a, uh, is it uh, the, the pressing of the kinds of issues that um, uh, uh, Thomas was raising now around climate, around other questions, the question of pharmaceutical uh, aid, for example, Brazil to, uh, to, to Africa, uh, that simply didn't lend themselves to the kind of, you know, a, a military hard power or conventional diplomacy. So uh, that, that, that's a question. I'm not uh, sure who exactly would want to uh, address it. I mean, there, there is a, a kind of utopianism in this, this interregnum. There's no question about it, which one's picking up. And one picks up also in the United States, maybe not the nigh liberalism. Not that, that's actually the least, because there's a great deal of talk going on also about civilian diplomacy, person-to-person -person diplomacy um, uh, in, 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 uh, from, from the 1990s. Not sure if that's uh, uh, if somebody wants to uh, address that. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if, if well, Jean Tibla is here, um, some someplace. Fernando is here too. Fernando, if you want to address that in terms of. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Victoria, I don't know if Jean wants to comment on that too, but I think your 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 question is very interesting and and, and I think it's it's very related uh, with what we try to work on uh, in our article, like um, try to think just that if it is possible to think of uh, 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 proposal of soft power from a non-centered uh, country. Mm -hmm. And if this is possible, like if this is, if a, a country can succeed on that being non-centered, right, being peripheral, maybe. And uh, I believe, trying to answer your, your question, I believe uh, it should be <laughs> uh, possible to try to, to propose some kind of uh, uh, different approach or multilateral and uh, and uh, trying to propose some kind of cooperation, as you mentioned, and um, I think the the case of Brazil at the time uh, we we analyzed the the Lula years and the the assertive foreign policy was uh, an example of uh, an attempt to do that, but of course with all the limitations. Uh, the internal limitations that the country had, like, and it still has, and um, the external forces too. The, as Thomas mentioned, the the hard power pressures, right? So I believe it would be, um, and it's desirable to to try to 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 develop that. But uh, as as Jack, as Oliver, as Thomas. Uh, mentioned already um, there are the 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 limitations of uh, and the the pressures of hard power and that but i think that we we, we should uh, look for a, a balance there i don't know if i, <laughs> if I... i'm gonna push on a little bit um to, to steve stephen uh their time raises um, some some hard hard questions about um, you know what what was at stake what kind of strategies were at stake when Nye makes his proposal in the in the nineteen nineties in other words one with respect to the United States as a leader 
uh, and therefore able to continue to command a narrative of a progressive, future-minded um, uh, polity uh, beyond the technical capacities it has, let's say, with the, uh, the, the internet. Um, and uh, also, what is that relationship to other strategies to the use of military force? Um, so to answer that, first of all, I would premise with a, a caution about what J Jack was saying. I, mean, I think Jack gives a very, you know, a, a litany of the so-called provincial, the regional powers who all fail, whether they're you know, authoritarian, um, former communist, or whether they're authoritarian, neo autonomist or they're some solidist, solidaristic leftist, uh, Brazil under Lula, but you could say also the United States terribly fails um, in, uh, in its own terms. That, that is nigh, uh, really as a double, as it evolves, you could call it a strategy, surprisingly, flu, I mean, the, the, the notion, there is a salesman vision of this. It's branding, rebranding American Marshall Plan, that tradition of sort of, uh, of, 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 a, kind of a power of attraction. But it, at a certain point, he does premise it on saying we also need to reform. We need a new deal. And uh, we also need the military to, to revamp how it, how it operates. And we need a new connection between the military and civilian power, which he puts forward in contact with the, the military industrial complex very, very openly in his uh, Smart Power Report of 2009, which he uh, joins with um, uh, Armitage, who is a former uh, member of the of neoconservatives. So, you know, we can sort of address that question. What then, what, what then is the outcome in, in terms of the United States? I mean, we can see this falling apart, but that, 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 that's a question. In other words, what, what happens, uh, what happens now? <laughs> in other words, this, this interregnum, you know, so where do we see, where, how do we respond to that question? the end of it, and what, what has the United States learned? And maybe I'll come back to Oliver on that, that, uh, that, he, that he would run respond, and also to Bushu, who certainly has viewed this very problematic American uh, approach uh, to exercise of soft power through the internet. So I guess the question, Oliver, was, you know, if you want to comment on the the nature of American foreign policy as a, as a sort of this liberal revision, which seems not to take place in the 1990s, coming out of the 1990s, except as a force to revive and spread markets rather yeah. than to reform institutions or to reform the relationship between military and uh, the soft, or to re reform the United States, to build infrastructure, to make it once more into a leading model. Yeah, I, I think that's that's really interesting because um, despite, and it's a bit odd, sort of the, the 90s and 2000s and 2010s, sort of that uh, from a Brazilian perspective, again, there's this uh, perception that uh, you know, the system needs to be reformed. Uh, you know, countries from the global south are, you know, deserve greater space. Um, Bretton Woods needs to adjust to um, the 21st century. Um, but at this, and, and, and the perception that this reform has fundamentally failed, but at the same time, countries like Brazil don't really want to rock the boat. There is no desire for some kind of revolutionary foreign policy. It's, it happens all within the existing structures. And despite you know, the continued uh, importance of hard power, of course, 
these are times when a country like Brazil, which possesses virtually no military power, weighs in on things like the responsibility to protect, develops its own idea of the responsibility while protecting uh, during the Libya intervention, and sort of engages on you know, nuclear uh, debates in Iran, et cetera. It does get a slap on the wrist by the United States at the time, leads to some tensions, but there's also, this is a, a time of enormous opportunity also. Uh, it is being cut short. And it, it was interesting when I, when we, when I listened to, to Jack, who's sort of saying that these attempts all failed. They failed, you know, I agree, because Brazil uh, collapsed, right? Uh, it, would be, it would have been an amazing uh, uh, sort of experiment to see what would have happened if Brazil had continued its, its, its rise, a very confident sort of a diplomatic uh, actor. Uh, so I think that, um, that, that uh, these, th this period of transition to Regnum uh, did also provide a lot of space for, for innovation by countries which had traditionally not done so before. Now, I think there's a clear sense that this period and the soft power period, let's say, has ended. There's a, an acute sense of the return of, of great power politics in Latin America. Uh, there's a joke now amongst Brazilian scholars and Brazilian diplomats that if you want to talk to somebody above the intern level in Washington, you have to say that you're there to discuss China in Latin America. If you just discuss Brazil, then you get to talk to sort of the, the, the you know, you get perhaps some 15 minutes with some uh, assistance, assistant. You really need to talk great power politics because the rest has become totally secondary. And I think that uh, suggests that the, 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 we, we're sort of past now this period of soft power because there's a clear sense that even though you still have a soft power rhetoric, it's really all about great power politics now, even in Latin America. Okay. Uh, that's good. Thank you. Monroe Price, uh, who is a very ex expert written, far longer than we have on these questions, uh, brings a, a comment and a question. He wants us to comment on the changing techniques of managing reception and diffusion of soft, soft power narratives, which is a very um, important question, which I, I don't think we deal with, well, perhaps the one we were, where we most dealt with it is almost in terms of the Euro European Union. But he, want, he wants to, um, refers also to Jack's comments uh, on comparative abilities to excel at effectiveness uh, at, the, uh, at affecting, affecting their soft power initiatives. The idea that Russia is more effective, finally, the extent to which the effectiveness of soft power is affected by weaknesses at home. So this relationship which is, is, is constantly referred to in the book, even though it's, it's a difficult problem, but between what's going on at home and what is this capacity to generate this powers of traction elsewhere? How, do they, how, does, it, how does it work? In Brazil, the, the inside outside brought about the collapse effectively in these outside initiatives with the ousting of Lula and uh, the, sh the shift then to Bolsonaro, the United States. The political shift uh, brought about significant changes, but it may be the bigger shift, a problem of lack of a reform, the New Deal, which would reassert American power. So this is a question I pose back to, to, to whoever wants to address it, um, the, 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 the question of how can the soft power in effect uh, compensate for the weaknesses at home, <laughs> or if there is um, the, uh, if there's a lack of legitimacy uh, in, uh, the, in the narrative, okay, and that the narrative has problems. So how does, Soft, can soft power project when the narrative itself about where that power is, uh, 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 the, the strengths of that power is, is wanting or weak. And I think this is not, doesn't only go for the illiberal um, regimes that Jack, you're, you're positing, but I mean, you might even want to refer back to the United States' dilemmas on that, on that score. From the very initial one, the 1990s, which, um, uh, Stephen Bertheim commented on where 
you know, the question is, well, you know, what, 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 what is a soft power concept obfuscating that, that you know, the, the problems of military engagement and what strategy should be uh, um, pursued, and the problem of reform at home to, to make the narrative more solid about America's primacy. Um, Vicky, I, um, I will need to step out at 2.30 because I'm teaching, but I want to kind of follow up. Yeah, I want to sort of um, say a little bit in response to your question and maybe call on some of our authors, because yeah. one of the things that I think we found in the narratives of counter hegemons was not necessarily trying to moralize what they do at home in order to be attractive abroad, but also like build more pragma pragmatic solidarities, right? Like using chi sort of China reaching out to countries in Eastern Europe. And I think Anastas can really speak to that, not necessarily based on always values and ideology, but mutual interests or, you know, Brazil using its own experience uh, with international organizations and poverty to reach out to other countries and find the sort of common ground um, in a more sort of, again, pragmatic way, not necessarily like normative way. And I, I think that could maybe get at some of what Monroe is asking. And I would love to hear from our authors um, if they have anything to say about that. And obviously, you know, Jack and Thomas too, if they see a similar trend in Europe and uh, the United States. Sure, I, I, I can pick up on that. I mean, uh, I, I think one of the, uh, the central things in the, the whole debate on soft power, also normative power, or symbolic power, whatever I use, and, and the side that often gets uh, uh, missed in the analysis is, of course, the, the recipient countries, or let's say the, 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 the target countries. Uh, and uh, I think in the case of China, it's, it's, it's very uh, illustrative, uh, since, as rightfully pointed out, uh, Butcher, there is no moralizing, there is no offering of best case example. Uh, there is uh, simply, you know, we come uh, with, uh, you know, uh, Chinese uh, participants say we come with a open uh, mind, we come with our open arms, and we see what's what's there, what, how we can help, how how we can assist. And uh, this has been particularly uh, striking in Eastern Europe after the, the global financial crisis, because you know this, these countries have been used to, you know, these have been countries that are economically semi-peripheral, dependent uh, capitalist economies. They have been used to having, let's say, either having European uh, uh, institutions, companies uh, reaching out and, and coming with investments or, or the, the American ones. And then, you know, China just steps in and this is what facilitates, uh, you know, the offer. There is no, uh, and, if, and, and you have cases where, you know, you have uh, people like Vitor Orban who has been very friendly uh, towards China, particularly welcoming Chinese influence uh, and Chinese uh, investments and, and basically uh, uh, announcing this policy of Easter winds uh, blowing in Hungary, who at the same time is very, you know, uh, ideologically anti-communist, right? But uh, there is no discussion of, you know, this, this higher politics. There is no discussion uh, on um, any kind of ideological issue. The, the key that unites uh, these, these different, uh, let's say, perspectives on China uh, and one thing that could link to that uh, kind of liberal modernity uh, uh, argument uh, uh, put forward by, by Snyder is uh, this uh, insistence on uh, there is no one best way. So I think, and this I think also contributes to the, uh, let's say the dismantling of, of the, the, the moral architecture of, of American soft power uh, after the, the, the global financial crisis. And this is what facilitates the advancement of, of China, not just in, in Eastern Europe, but uh, elsewhere around the region. And of course, we were talking about these uh, years when it was still uh, before uh, great power politics uh, entered uh, uh, the arena. So uh, it is uh, this idea that there is no one uh, best, one uh, universally acceptable way of doing things. And this is what China has been uh, offering, you know, alternative way of, of, of doing uh, economic cooperation, alternative way of uh, doing uh, development and so on. 
and I, I wanted to put one uh, one argument forward as well uh, when it comes to uh, the peripheral countries of Europe. Uh, when it comes to also uh, the, the the normative for the soft power of the EU, you know, uh, you, uh, it, it has been very interesting to follow, for instance, uh, the Ukraine crisis or uh, debates on on the EU uh, in the Balkan countries. Uh, Ukraine was the first place and probably the only place where people have actually fought and even uh, uh, even died under the EU flag, the Maidan protest 2014. Uh, this was uh, uh, another argument uh, why uh, the, the, the position of, of periphery matters. Uh, in the Balkan countries, for instance, uh, EU enlargement still is pretty high on the political agenda. And people, uh, we've had, uh, let's say, European officials coming to uh, the Balkan region uh, saying that people in the Balkans are more enthusiastic about the EU and have more idealistic view of the EU than people in the EU itself. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, I, I guess the right way to, to uh, I mean, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the things that need to be seen uh, to, to analyze the, the power of uh, the appeal of EU, like whether we call it normative power or soft power, is to really look at, uh, you know, these enlargement processes, these uh, uh, developments in the periphery, and how the narratives of, of the EU are really uh, you know, being developed from the outside. And, and very often these are uh, you know, uh, too enthusiastic, too, too optimistic, probably don't even uh, match uh, narratives within the EU itself. Uh, I guess that was uh, from me. Unfortunately, we are, our panelists are having to leave to go teach and to do other engagements. So Virtue wishes you oh, Virtue wishes you well and thanks you for being here. Likewise, Stephen Bertheim. And you know, we have to uh, close close up now. I, I want to thank all of you. It was just a, a joy to <laughs> see collaborators and to see lots of friends and colleagues who, who are attending. Um, this is a, a project that uh, we concluded, thank goodness, but by attaching to it an enormous bibliography, raisonné, we are also suggesting there's a lot of work to be done, and this is something that one might share with students and colleagues and get them to think about it. So thank you, you all. Thank you, the European Institute, for its sponsorship, thanking our panelists, um, hoping to see you all all our collaborators soon in the, in the flesh. Uh, we are now have to uh, wrap up the meeting. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for, for leading thank a great Thank you so project. much. Thank you. thank you. We will travel again. We will travel again. Yeah. All of you. <laughs> Here's to, here's thank to you. that very Bye. rich. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Jaren, thank you. Thanks.